Coming up at 3.30, we will start to unveil the top 11 athletes in Philadelphia right now. But before then, right this second, we welcome one of the top Philadelphia athletes of all time, one yeah. Brian Dawkins. He would have been at the head of that list. Yes, several <laughs> at, years. At one day, at some point, he would have been at the head of the list. Abs- right now. Wait, he, between he, AI. Yes. Five. Yep. Who was it? Jim Tomey at that time? Oh, at that time. Well, yeah, I'm just Tomey. during the times yeah. that he played. During the time that he played. Tomey. Yeah. You would have been at the top of that list somewhere, dog. Man, come on, man. Them some big, them some big, big, not big time dudes. You talking about? Man. You're, you're a big man, time. That's dude. why you fit right there in there with those guys, man. You fit in there. So, uh, no, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you. The Brian Dawkins uh, Driving Impact Celebrity Golf Tournament. It's at Penn Oaks Golf Club in Westchester, June second and third. You can go to BrianDawkins dot com for auction items, tickets, all that kind of stuff. You a good golfer, Doc? <laughs> I'm a golfer, dog. <laughs> 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 I, don't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put good nowhere close to golfer, but I'm a golfer. But he's out I'm there. He's he's an athlete. He he he's out there. And and <laughs> and, and, and Spike, you 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 mentioned the uh, the soiree yeah. that we have uh, that Sunday night, man. Yep. Um, we still have tickets, right, dog? That's available for yep. people who who want to attend. And it, it is a great. It, it really is a great night. About 35, 40 former athletes. Maybe a couple current ones there. It, it, it's it's a uh, it's an awesome night. I'll let I'll let Doc go ahead and talk about it. But I just we've done it for three years now, and it seems like it's getting bigger and better each year, Doc. Yeah, man. I, 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 you can continue on, Jack. Cause you, you, <laughs> you lit it up. You lit it up. What was that? Two years ago when you took the mic. So, not. But no, it's it's a great it's a great event. A lot of people. A lot a lot of laughter. Um, you know, a lot of good good food. And so, yeah, we do have tickets still available. That's one of the reasons I'm getting on because I want to uh, let people have that opportunity to be able to come out and, and spend some time with people that you've looked up to and people that you've seen on TV play the you know game of football, basketball, and baseball, and you get a chance to sit down and, and dine with them. Yeah, it's a full meal, right? A full night. So, mm-hmm. wait, you said I got on the mic. He didn't. He didn't do any singing, did he? Oh. <laughs> Well, I, well, you know what? That's actually where you recorded me doing the uh, Sixers. Oh, right. Uh, the Sixers song, song last year. That was last year when they won Game Five up in Boston. <laughs> oh, that was okay. So yeah, it was that last. was yeah, that was last year after they won Game Five in Boston that night, and the news broke while we were in the middle of the live auction. Okay. And you know, if I had a, a microphone in my hand, I, I had to start doing the whole Sixer thing. You didn't have to. <laughs> well, so BrianDawkins.com, that's where you can get tickets for the soiree, which is on Sunday night. And there's the uh, the auction items are up there on the site as well. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, Brian Dawkins, Driving Impact, those structures has blessed us. And the Blue, uh, the Blue Water Group, is, is, you know, it's because of them, we're able to do what we're doing with this, with this golf tournament. And I really wanted to give them a shout out because – one of the things that, that really is a blessing is to see the smiles of the faces of the parents and the young people that we're blessing with these opportunities to do different things. And so, you know, that's one of the drives of it, to bless single parents for the foundation. And this golf tournament goes a long way into providing these things, these opportunities for these young people, these single parent households, and also some of the things that we're doing in high schools. I think we have like 24 high schools we're doing cerebral wellness packages for in in uh, or excuse me in Philadelphia and we have about five or six schools in Jacksonville that are a part of it. So we're very thankful. Yeah, Doc's um his impact foundation, man, it, it is truly having a, a great impact. And the thing I love about Doc, obviously this dude is um a Hall of Famer, is one of the game's greatest to play at his position and he's He's known all across the country. He does a lot of um, speaking engagements. He goes out into the community back where he's from in Jacksonville, where he's living at now, down in Orlando. But the the work that he continues to do out here in this area, um, it shows you the connection that he still has with this city and with the community in this area that uh, his foundation is continuing to have a huge impact. And like I said, it's getting it's getting bigger and bigger each year, man. No, again, appreciate you all, man. Appreciate you. Doc, We've uh, there's been a lot of conversation this offseason with the Eagles about uh, leadership and who led and who didn't lead and all that sort of stuff, and you were known as one. My question to you is, what makes a good leader on a team? Um, it, it's 
it, it, my perspective on leadership comes from my faith, right? So, you know, my the good book tells me that the greatest among you should serve the most. The greatest among you should serve the most. So that talking, that's talking about servant leadership. So that's talking about me being able to be all that I can for my teammates the higher that I get. So the more accolades that I gain, the more respect that I gain, the more, um, you know, whatever cachet you want to call it, influence that I gained, I was doing my very best to bless my teammates, to give to my teammates, to um, look at if I can speak words of encouragement into my teammates, watching to see what they do something well and seeing if I can speak life into those, you know, those things that they, they don't see. Right. So my 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 view of leadership is from that perspective. So you have to have an open ear, but you have you got to be a worker. Like, that's the first thing you like. I can't I couldn't have asked Ike or any of my teammates to do anything that I was not displaying on the field every doggone practice. Mm-hmm. Like, if I'm not running, if I ask them to run to the ball, I'm not running to the ball. They're going to look at the field and say, well, you're not running to the ball. What, what am I running the ball for? Right. So I have to be the example. So that's the first thing you you're. You know, the greatest sermon that I'll ever preach is the life that I live. So I have to live it and walk it. And then I can then reach back and then ask guys, you know, not I don't demand anything from anybody, but I, I encourage them to come along with me, to, to join my party so that we can do this thing together, right? So that's how I see leadership, right? And when you're talking about leadership of the Philadelphia Eagles, um, you don't – Usually what happens is when you have guys that step away from the game of football, there are leaders in the wings waiting to step into those spaces. Like when I was there, it was Troy and, and you know, my, my Irv, they, those were the guys. But when they walked away, then that allowed me to step into those spaces to then lead, right? So the leaders already should be in-house. They should probably have already been leading behind the scenes in, in different pockets. And now they're having an the opportunity to step into, you know, into the forefront to show how their how their leadership skills can then help this team. Do you think it is something that is natural in leaders, or do you think it's something that can be learned? I think that it is a it is a learned thing. Um, I, I, I didn't necessarily come out and say that I wanted to be a leader. But I was trying to make the dog on team. I'm just being honest with you. I wasn't trying to lead nobody nowhere. I was trying to make the dog on team to see if I could bless my family. And so in that, though, I began to recognize the, the important, importance of there were people watching me, how I did what I do. And then if I can then help them be better, then we'll be a better team. So that's, I began to then take that to another level as far as, okay, if that's the case, let me develop more of myself because I always want to be a, a asset to my teammates, asset to my team. I never want to be a liability. So I began to do things in a way to once again be able to then ask them to come along with me. Hey, you know, I, talk, I would pull a guy to the side and talk a little bit. I was never. I would never get on somebody in public or or do anything. Excuse me, in front of the, the football team, I would pull them to the side and we would talk one on one about something that I see in them, right? And so that allowed me to then take those that leadership responsibility and allow me to begin to 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 be that type of leader that I wanted to be. So parts of it is a learned behavior that you you know you want to then help other people be better. That's how that's kind of how I see leadership. Like I again. I wanted to make sure that the, how I presented myself, how I worked, gave an example to whomever was under me of how to get this thing done, how to not just be a, a good player, but how to be a professional at your job as well. And he was one of the best at it. Uh, we're talking to Eagles great, uh, Brian Dawkins. Dawk, you know, I got to experience that with you firsthand. You know, you pouring into me. Um uh, with that type of leadership and the, you know, the ability to have those quiet conversations, those intimate conversations and impactful conversations. But also being there from the time I got drafted to watching you play, I also got a chance to watch you evolve from someone who led by example and sort of had sort of these these intimate sort of moments with your teammates if you felt 
the the your your heart pull you that way of someone ask of your type of leadership. But then I also saw where you evolved to someone that stepped out there and was that vocal leader, right? Like the out of the locker room. And talk to me a little bit about how that transition was for you, being able to to be a leader one way, and then as you continued throughout your career, you became one of the faces, if not the voice, of the locker room later in your career. What was that like for you as far as displaying your leadership? <laughs> it was very uncomfortable from the beginning. Very uncomfortable because I'm an introvert. Like, I would, again, if it was up to me, I would go work and do my job. I would put my head down and I would grind and I would get better and I would do the very best that I can to be the very best be to be the very best that I could. And so to be able to then step into that forefront and, and also, cause sometimes you can hear me tripping over my words, even when I speak now, cause I talk so fast sometimes, you know, I, I stuttered, I stuttered quite a bit when I was younger. And so I was never someone that liked to step, step out and speak in front of people because of that. And so to then have to then not have to, to feel the pull and feel the, uh, uh, the desire to step into the space because I saw things that needed to be done, saw things that needed to be said. They weren't said, and I wanted to then step into that space to say the things that needed to be said so that we can be the team that we needed to be, right? So I had to get out of my – basically, I'm telling you, you got to get out of your comfort zone. You got to step outside of comfort and step into that space knowing that and when you get when – you've, when you've done everything that you can do to be the best that you can be, Sometimes you got to step out of that comfort zone to then have conversations out loud to have people then go into a different direction than they're heading. But because if, if anybody know anything about rowing, I don't necessarily know about rowing, but if we are all <laughs> rowing in different directions, man, we don't go in circles, right? Yep. But if we, as soon as we get on the same page, and sometimes, and sometimes those conversations, and you know what, like sometimes those conversations are a little bit more forceful than others, right? Mm -hmm. So knowing how then have an emotional intelligence of how to have communications with your teammates. Like I, I may, me and I, me, I may be, I may be able to talk to Ike a little bit different than I can talk to another dude. Like if I talk to, you know, Ike in an aggressive way, he, Ike get hyped like that. He, you know, we, we get hyped with each other when it comes to that. <laughs> I might can't get on another dude in that way and have them, you know, come to that level of understanding to go to that place, that person, you know, may get mad and, you know, shut down or, um, or something else. So again, I have to then have the emotional intelligence of how to lead, lead my teammates. And I've done that because I've studied them. I've watched them. I've watched how they handle situations. I've watched how the coaches talk to them and their body language when they then talk are talked to in different ways. I watch those things. So I was a student, and I'm just letting you know, like I was a student of watching y'all, watching sure. my teammates. Of, of how 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 I can best lead the team. I'm I'm blown away. <clears throat> excuse me, with you saying that you were an introvert. Just th <laughs> thinking thinking about you as I know you as you know as player and as person now. It's crazy for me to think about the fact that you considered yourself to be that way one day. I mean, it just seems like such a, an enormous change. No, I know. Uh, uh, it's not. I was that way one day. I'm still an introvert. I love my me time, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I love my me time, man. Uh, so the Eagles took a couple of uh, defensive secondary guys in the beginning of the draft with Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeGean. What, what do you think is the biggest adjustment playing defensive backfield going from college to the pros? The biggest adjustment for me was the the checks, you know, having the defense, knowing the defense, knowing that they go through motion and they shift and do this, if they come in this formation, you're going to check all these different things up on the Emmett. <laughs> Emmett had a whole bunch of stuff in his defensive, mm -hmm. um, in his scheme, man. Like, it, like Mike Zordas would li literally call the defense down in distance, personnel. Like, he would literally call the defense from the field. And that was a part of knowing the defense, right? So you would have to come to grasp it in that way of not having to think on the field, right? Knowing the defense to the point that you can call the defense, but also now you can still go back to anticipating what's coming because you know the down and distance, you know the personnel. So that was, to me, that was the hardest part of the game of football. I could run, I can tackle, I can jump, all of those things, you know, th those weren't a, 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 a big adjustment for me. 
But the mental aspect of it, the verbiage of, you know, the, how long some, some of the defensive play callers are, the, again, knowing what you have to do when they shift to different formations, that was the one that got me. That was the one that got me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the personnel on that side of the ball, dog. A lot of young talent uh, acquired over the last two years. I think they're headed in the right direction when you just look at trying to build a defense that can sort of play together. I can't wait to see them at some point this year and then get your thoughts on just what they look like out there uh, as a team. But just just your thoughts on uh, Vic Fangio coming in as the new D coordinator and, and what sort of to expect from a defense that we really, I guess, don't have a lot of answers. Got a lot of questions about them, but don't have a lot of answers as to what type of defense this, we should expect this year. So, here, so here's the thing. Anytime that you get a guy who's been in the game as long as Nick has been, what you do is what? You go back and look at his other defenses. Mm-hmm. All right? What has his other defenses done? What, does it, what have they been about? Right? And if the last couple of – if his last couple of stops, stops um, gives you any highlight of what to expect in Philadelphia, you can expect this defense to be vastly improved. Mm-hmm. Effort to the ball running to the ball, right? Angles taken, tackling in an open like you, it should be it should be a complete differently d- different defense than we saw last year. That defense last year was I, I'm not going to even go there. Like it was it was disheartening to watch some of the things how how they went um and did not perform down the stretch especially. Like they got worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So, you know, my 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 the whole thing for me, Ike, when it comes to all of the personnel that is being brought in, I love it, right? But we saw last year what happens when there's disconnect. When I, I, and I know I'm not pointing the finger. No, I don't know who was what. All mm-hmm. I know that there was disconnect on the offensive um, play calling and the defensive play calling. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> we saw last year what we can because we did have talent on that team last year. There was talent on the field. But that talent was not, in my opinion, coached up to a way to allow the best of those that talent to come to the forefront. Mm-hmm. We didn't see that. Yeah. So, again, I'm hoping that this year that there's only one cook in the kitchen, and that's the offensive defensive coordinator that are calling the things, and then they can then go about doing what they need to do because the offensive co- coordinator is the same way. You look at his previous stops, he's had success. He's done things in specific ways. He's had, he's had success. So we can expect that to happen. It's not a guarantee, but we can expect for this to be a vastly improved uh, team this year. You know, Doc, we're talking to Eagles great Brian Dawkins. You you mentioned, uh, you know, the offensive and defensive coordinator sort of, and, and fewer cooks in the kitchen and them sort of, you know, heading their units. That that puts, and they talked about this before the season, that puts Sirianni in a position where they effectively said he's sort of like a CEO, has an eye on everything. How much does a head coach uh, affect culture, like it, especially in an NFL locker room? How much, how much of that is set by the coach? It is, it is set by the coach. It is set by the head coach, the direction that this team is going to be because – In in most situations, it is the head coach that hires the coordinators. And so that usually means that the coordinators have the same mental makeup as the head coach. So they're on the same page as far as what we're going to be. We're going to be a physical team. We're going to be yada, yada, yada. So the coordinators basically are an extension of the head coach, and then they – are the ones that are in front of the t- of the offense and defense the most. We're not in front of the head coach all the time. We're in front of the defensive coordinator and mostly our off- our um, position coaches the most. So it's, it's it's literally the head of the 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 football team is the head coach, and then the kind of the body of everything is the off the uh, coordinators and then the players. So again, the head coach should be the visionary of how this team is going to be. What what are we going to be about? What 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 should you expect to see when you step when this team this team steps on the field? What type of team should it be? That should come from the head coach. Hmm. 
That sounds great, brother. Yeah, well, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the end of last year, we've talked about it a lot. I, I, I think a, lo- a lot of people here have sort of washed the taste of it out of their mouths, but mm-hmm. that was as angry as I've seen people for the, the end of a season and as bad as it's been here. I can only think of one or two other times, so... Uh, you're, well, 2020 for sure. Yeah, <laughs> 2020 was bad. Yeah, 2020 actually. was bad. Yeah, I, forgot yeah, about I, I don't. I don't. I don't even. I mean, as bad as 2020 might have been, there. I, there's, there's nothing like that. I don't. I. Man, I'm. A, <laughs> I literally lose my words when I try to talk about what the collapse of last year, of of how that you could just see there was a slow and steady decline of. You know, a whole bunch of the, the the and you know this, Ike, of mm-hmm. the 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 small things that you're supposed to be doing on the field that weren't being done week after week after week after week and nobody nobody saw it, nobody adjusted to it, mm-hmm. nobody spoke out and said this is what needs to happen with it, right? And so again, that yeah, we watched that taste out of our mouths. But here's the thing, as a team, as a team, you, you, you never completely forget about the past. Right. Like, you need to remember that the past happens so that, so that junk never happens again. Like, that, that, that type of plummet from being one of the favorites to just absolutely just plummeting towards the end, that should never happen again. And if you were in a leader in that locker room, if you went through that pain, that pain should rise your leadership. And I, 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 you can see a lot of guys who are, seems to be in better condition, right? They're, they're getting better. They're getting more fit, right? And I believe a lot of that is because of the pain of last year. The pain drives you, man. I don't, people don't understand this. When you go through painful situations, pain can rec- make, you, make you recognize what you need to do better, Right. Yeah. So that's what I hope happened to these dudes in the locker room. I heard, I hope the pain and the embarrassment of last year was so painful that it is driving their behinds in that weight room. It's driving their behind studying the, the getting the, the, the play calls of these new coordinators down packs so that they can go perform and dominate. Well, if pain drives them, they're going to drive a long way because that was really <laughs> painful last year. <laughs> So the uh, the Driving Impact Celebrity Golf Tournament, the Brian Dawkins Golf Tournament, it's at Penn Oaks Golf Club in Westchester. There are still tickets for the uh, the soiree on mm-hmm. Sunday night. You can go to briandawkins.com. The, the third, June, June 3rd is that well, Sunday, no, right? No, sun, the second is that Sunday. The second is the Sunday, the Monday. Okay, yeah. so, so so that is Sunday night. And there's auction items there as well. Yep. Uh, we, we appreciate oh, yeah. your please, time, Doc. Please go check out the auction items. Please go check that out. All right, brother. Listen, man, thank you. Once again, look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. Indeed, brother. Indeed. All All right. right. Y'all be blessed. All right. Thanks, Doc.